Nature naturally produces a surplus of animals. We as hunters and trappers are only skimming the surface of that surplus. This is a situation where the infrastructure of an airport is at risk. Water's lapping at both sides of the runway. The abutting landowner, the 26,000 acres, does not allow trapping. And it is all lowland, marshy stuff. So that is a beaver factory. In the last two years, we've taken 25 beavers off of this, this property. And this year, there's three new huts. Fur-bearing species do not die a quiet, peaceful death in the wild, whether through disease, starvation, at the predation of other animals, dying quickly by a trapper coming along and dispatching this animal really is, is about the most humane death these animals can hope to find. All these marks are fight marks from other beavers. This is what happens when you have too many beavers for the available resource in a specific area. Right now, there's more wildlife in the state of Vermont than there was 50 years ago when I came here. Their population numbers, especially for our fur bears, are blowing up. They're not blowing up in a healthy, good way. They're running out of food. One spring, because of overpopulation, there was like 100 muskrats floating in the pond that were dead because they starved. There's a phrase, emerging infectious disease. Of those emerging infectious diseases, 75% of them have some kind of connection to wildlife. The pathogens that can affect us and domestic animals are the concerns of wildlife agencies as much as they are agriculture departments and health departments. Mange and distemper can be passed on to domestic animals and rabies can be passed on to humans as well. And the more they go unregulated, they move into our urban areas, the more opportunity that they have to create a health hazard. To take away the trapper's ability to collect that animal is to undermine that effort to look for diseases which have implications in a wide variety of populations, including you and me. I've seen what overpopulation does and seen it for 47 years, dying of diseases, the most horrible death you could ever imagine. And I've seen animals with mange, distemper, rabies, parvo, and it's not a pretty sight. When we had a big outbreak of rabies on the red fox here, it was five or six years, you could not see a red fox, they were gone. A lot of folks have dogs or cats, and they love them. They, I think, emotionally draw a connection from their love of their dogs or cats to a lot of the fur-bearing creatures out in the wild. And they go, how could anybody ever do something to the equivalent of a pet. When their dog or cat ultimately is maybe terminally ill and declining, they eventually, usually will put them to sleep to put them out of their suffering. I trap in the vicinity of 20 coyotes a year and 50% of them had mange. Any animal that has the mange mites looks terrible. It's a parasite that gets into their skin and it forces them to scratch and scratch and scratch. A lot of the fur is falling out. Often there's no fur on the tail. The legs will be all bare and they're miserable. Red fox is 100% fatal if they have mange, but they can live for several months and usually they end up freezing to death in the wintertime because there's no hair left on their body. There's no question that a bullet is much more humane dispatch than an animal suffering with the mange, trying to survive a winter in Vermont. I've seen raccoons chasing people down a road when the rabies was, was heavy in Vermont. I've caught a lot of rabies animals and taken them out of dangerous situations around schools, around the library, underneath the restaurants. I put down two raccoons, one in the middle of Barry City at 10 o'clock in the morning on a playground. There's a one bill to change trapping regulations to include best management practices. Before we could even get that through legislature, there are two more bills out to try to end trapping. It's very important that people on both sides of the issue pledge to disagree peacefully and to have these discussions like adults. When we only look at a single issue without putting it in context of broader economics, broader social dynamics, I think we really do a disservice to the conversation. I would try to discourage legislators from voting to ban trapping. If you have any questions, you should call 
the Fish and Wildlife Department. I would urge decision makers to look beyond the emotion of this topic. Take a second and look at the science and listen to these people who have dedicated their lives to wildlife management. Listen to your biologists. None of them want bad things for wildlife. They are a proponent of trapping because it's a strong tool.